I've been uh, very, very much involved in, uh, in your lives. And we remember today in the ceremony we'll have uh, after the speech, remembering those uh, here in our own team, the Foreign Service and Civil Service, who've also given their lives uh, to uh, advance the interest of our country. It's obviously also a dramatic time to be reflecting on the role of the United States in the world and the uh, remarkable events that are taking place, uh, most especially uh, throughout the, the wider Middle East. Um, we really have a sense, I think, that history is uh, accelerating uh, and that uh, we see the speed of change growing uh, ever more dramatically in a very uh, dramatic way. Uh, for me, this has been brought home in reflecting on my own experience in government and the opportunity I had um, just a few weeks ago to pay tribute to another great American uh, public service, Secretary Warren Christopher, whom I had the privilege to serve with uh, twice before in my own government service. When I first came into government uh, now more than 30 years ago, I had a chance to work with then Deputy Secretary Christopher uh, on, among other issues, the Iranian hostage crisis, and that's why I'm especially proud to be able to wear the yellow ribbon today to remember the sacrifices that were made by our, uh, our, our men and women uh, there in Iran. Uh, and that very dramatic set of events, which seemed like uh, they were going to transform the world. I came back into government uh, again in uh, 1993 uh, to be part of yet another dramatic transformation, the end of the Cold War, the end of the occupation of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and the flowering of freedom and opportunity in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, then working for then Secretary Warren Christopher and now back as Deputy Secretary of State and sitting in Warren Christopher's old chair as Deputy Secretary and working with Secretary Clinton and the President and so many others to deal with these dramatic challenges that are taking place in the Middle East. And I think we can draw some lessons about this, which is that one, it's very clear that uh, when it comes to great events of our time, no matter how much uh, wisdom and experience we bring, that uh, change happens and sometimes happens in ways that we can't anticipate. But what's equally important is that in order to be able to manage and shape change, we have to have the kind of talent and experience of people who know the world, know the people, know the cultures, know the histories that allow us to adapt and to pursue enduring uh, U.S. interests and enduring engagement with the world. I think it's especially important, too, as we think about these dramatic uh, sets of events, that we think about the underlying forces that are shaping this world as we think about our strategy uh, to pursue U.S. interests going forward. What's been clear as we look over the last 30 years and these dramatic uh, forces of change is that we're seeing a world with increased globalization and interdependence and a technological revolution that are bringing people closer and closer together and creating new opportunities for human uh, uh, realization of potential, but also enabling forces that can be very dangerous and threatening. And we see the emergence of new powers and new actors, including non-state actors. And though we continue to place a lot of importance in our traditional diplomacy, state-to-state -state diplomacy, that so many of you have practiced, we also are learning to have to engage with a broader world of new forces in the media, in civil society, uh, forces of NGOs, but also terrorists and international criminals that shape uh, our world. And yet, as we see these forces of change, we also are mindful that there are also some constants. The constants are the enduring commitment of the United States to help shape the world, but equally important, our enduring commitment to our universal values that not only motivate us at home and are embodied in our own political institutions, but are things that we support and aspire to for people around the world. So as we try to face these new challenges in Egypt and Tunisia and throughout the Middle East, as well as in uh, our own hemisphere and in East Asia and Africa, I think it's important that we keep in mind uh, some basic principles that have been outlined by the President and the Secretary, and they come as lodestars as we begin to deal with this very uh, world in flux. The first is we've increasingly recognized that no nation, no matter how powerful, including the United States, can master the challenges of the 21st century acting alone. And yet, we need cooperation, but it doesn't just happen automatically. We need the kind of leadership that can galvanize both uh, nations and peoples, to work together to meet common challenges. And I think we've all recognized, and you've seen in your own careers, that the United States is uniquely positioned to provide that kind of global leadership, to work with others to meet the challenges of providing economic opportunity, to meet the needs for a clean and sustainable planet for our future, but also to meet the dangers that this new world has brought about. 
in trying to provide this leadership. Secretary Clinton, in an important speech last year, talked about the need for a network of alliances and partnerships, regional organizations and global institutions that is durable and dynamic enough to help us meet today's challenges and adapt to threats that we cannot even conceive of, just as our parents never dreamt of melting glaciers or dirty bombs. She called the structure that we're seeking to build the global architecture of cooperation. And as you look around the world today at the efforts that we are making, both in our foreign service, our civil service, and with our military in Afghanistan, in Libya, and around the world, you can see the emergence of these new strategies of global cooperation. And I want to talk just a little bit briefly today before I turn to your questions about those elements. First, as the Secretary said, the cornerstone of our engagement in the world continues to be uh, America's allies. We've learned over the years that although these alliances may have emerged in very particular contexts, that they have a very durable value to us that goes beyond the circumstances in which they were created. And this begins, of course, with our uh, traditional allies in Europe, our NATO partners, who continue to be uh, our partners of choice when it comes to meeting great global challenges as we've seen today, whether it's dealing with uh, creating uh, democracy and dealing with the, the threats in the Middle East, or whether it's in Afghanistan, or whether it's thinking about how we can work together to shape a more peaceful and prosperous transatlantic community for the future. But it also extends to our allies in East Asia, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and others, who have helped us traverse this new world with the end of the Cold War in East Asia and begin to develop a strong partnership that can create a community of economic prosperity, a community of values, and a community of partnership that will help us deal with such diverse challenges as the nuclear program in North Korea or the opportunity to maintain the free and open navigation that's so necessary to global commerce throughout East Asia. We see it here, too, in our hemisphere, in the tremendously important partnerships with Canada and Mexico and the deepening relationships that we're developing both bilaterally with each and trilaterally together, and recognizing that these are unique relationships, the tremendous uh, interrelationship between our peoples and our economies uh, that are reflected in the day-to-day -day lives of our citizens provides a tremendous resource that doesn't get the kind of attention that some other challenges face. And you've seen uh, over the past two years a deepened commitment by the President and the Secretary to this partnership with Canada and Mexico. But as we begin with these traditional alliances, we also recognize that the world is changing and that there are new and important actors emerging, and they are increasingly important part of our global engagement and the opportunities that we have to shape the future. We now see, for example, that Brazil, Indonesia, and Turkey are now among the top 20 economies, countries which for many of you during your service, we're simply struggling to emerge uh, from deep uh, challenges of uh, political and uh, economic development. And we see new partners emerging in every region of the world. And of course, we pay particular attention to some of the most increasingly systemically important countries, beginning with countries like India, who has become an increasingly important partner to the United States. And the ability to deepen our relationship with India has been an important priority as symbolized by the fact that during the first um, state visit that took place during the Obama administration was by the Prime Minister of India and the President's most recent trip to India. We've recognized that the groundwork for this relationship was laid by previous presidents, by President Clinton's uh, very important visit to India during his term and the deepening relationship under President Bush. But over the past two years, we've tried to broaden and deepen that relationship and reflected on the fact that this is a partnership of both interest and values and the importance of our working together with the world's largest democracy, not only in South Asia, but increasingly in East Asia as well. Our relationship with China, too, is at the forefront of our strategy going into the future. It's a complex relationship, but we all recognize that when the United States and China can work together, we bring tremendous resources to meet these global challenges of our time whether it's fueling global economic growth or dealing with the problem of greenhouse gases and climate change. Uh, we recognize that uh, China and the United States together cannot alone solve the world's problems, but when we are working together, uh, they can make a huge difference. And we've been motivated in this administration by a belief that a conflict between the United States and China is not inevitable. 
as some political theorists might suggest. But also, cooperation is not guaranteed, and that we need to work hard at trying to find areas of cooperation and trying to find ways to manage the differences when they occur. The next week here in the department uh, will be part of what has become a signature part of our engagement and dialogue with China, the strategic and economic dialogue that will bring well over 100 senior officials from China here to meet with their counterparts, not just here at the State Department, but the Treasury and across the U.S. government, uh, to try to build a sustained and long-term relationship that can meet the challenges of the 21st century. With Russia, too, we're building a new and productive relationship that began in the very first days of the Obama administration with the commitment to try to reset the relationship and to try to find ways to work together more effectively with Russia uh, where we can and to recognize that while we may have differences, we should not allow those differences to derail us from working together on important challenges. And we've seen the benefits of that reset, uh, most notably in the uh, really uh, landmark uh, arms control agreement, the New START agreement, but also in the cooperation that we're undertaking and working together to deal with the challenges of Afghanistan and to try to deal with some of the other uh, economic and political issues throughout uh, the transatlantic region. And so we see enormous opportunities to build that relationship for the future and that close working relationship that's emerged between the President and his counterpart, between the Secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov is a reflection of the fact that we can uh, produce benefits for both countries going forward. We've seen this too in our hemisphere with the uh, deepening relationship with Brazil and the President's uh, visit to Brazil, the Secretary's participation in the inauguration of the new President there as a recognition that we can also find new opportunities in a country that has many similarities to our own, a multicultural, a multi-ethnic, multi-racial society uh, where we can learn from each other and have a real partnership that recognizes, again, that while there may be some differences, that we have much to do together, not only bilaterally, but also working together on regional challenges like bringing uh, stability and opportunity to Haiti, but also on global challenges around the world. To, along with these uh, traditional relationships of countries, both alliances and emerging powers, we're also paying increased attention to the need to build institutional structures of cooperation, both to strengthen the uh, existing institutions and also to build new ones where the existing institutions don't meet the challenges of our time. We're seeing, for example, a new spirit at the United Nations where the United, States, the United Nations is now no longer seen as, a, as a, an obstacle to U.S. interest, but really an important vehicle for achieving our results, as we've seen in the important sanctions that we've been able to enact to deal with the North Korean and Iranian nuclear program, or the really remarkable commitment that the U.N. made to deal with civilian protection in Libya. This is a way to leverage U.S. power and influence, and we've seen by deepening our engagement, whether it's in the Security Council or the decision to join the UN Human Rights Council, that the United States can see these as opportunities to mobilize the cooperation we need for global challenges. But it's not just in the global institutions, but also in regional institutions that we've deepened our commitment. Working with traditional institutions like NATO and the OSCE, where we've had important summits uh, in recent months to make sure that these institutions are ready and able to meet the challenges of the 21st century, whether it's in this hemisphere with the Organization of American States, where the Secretary has twice participated in their key meetings, whether it's the African Union, where I had the privilege of representing the United States in Addis just a few months ago, or <clears throat> now in East Asia with the decision by the United States to become a full member of the East Asia Summit. The Secretary's participation this past year in Vietnam and the, and the President's intended participation at the summit in Indonesia later this year. It's a recognition that these regional institutions have tremendous opportunity to bring countries together to meet common challenges and to provide leadership that allows the United States to be an effective player but not to carry the burden all by ourselves. And so we see these regional institutions as an increasingly important part of our overall strategy. And as I said, we also need to develop and adapt new approaches where existing institutions aren't ready for the, the current challenges, such as the decision to um, play a more significant role and give in increased emphasis to the G20 on the economic front, which has proved a critical <clears throat> opportunity to bring not only the traditional industrialized powers, but also some of the emerging economies to bear 
on trying to restore global economic growth and promote trade and investment, or as we've seen on the climate change challenge, the new major economies forum, which is an opportunity to provide some cutting edge leadership to supplement the more formal UN framework convention efforts. And we've seen how those two can come together in the very successful uh, climate change summit that was hosted uh, by Mexico and Cancun last year. Now, all of these institutions and bilateral relationships have to be complemented by an increasing awareness that it's not just governments, as I've said, but also civil society and non-state actors that are a critical part of our strategy. And along with our partners in AID and elsewhere uh, throughout the government, we're increasingly engaging with civil society. And nowhere is that more obvious or dramatic than the events that we're seeing taking place in the Middle East. While we continue to have important partnerships with governments, and this is an important part of our work, we recognize that in the long term, we are not going to be able to achieve our national objectives for either prosperity or security if we don't have the support of the publics in those countries. And so as we see these events unfold in Tunisia, in Egypt, and throughout the region, we see people taking to the street, uh, aspiring to and espousing the same values and principles that animated our own revolution, we see increasingly important opportunities to partner with them to build a long-term future in which our interests and our values are both achieved. And whether it's through our political and economic engagement, whether through its assistance, whether it's through bringing young people from the Middle East uh, to train and learn from our own experiences. I had a chance to meet uh, just a, a few weeks ago with a remarkable group of young people uh, from the Middle East, from Morocco and Algeria and the Palestinian area, from Syria and the Gulf, all of whom came here as part of our MEPI program to study in the United States, to work with your successors in the, in the department here to learn about the tools and techniques of leadership. This is all part of our being part of this dramatic change that's taking place. We don't believe there's a, uh, a distinction or a conflict between our ideals and interests. This is an opportunity to validate them both. And I think we are hopeful, recognizing that while the outcomes in these very diverse but dramatic uh, developments in the region have no certain outcome, but only if we stay engaged and stay partnering with these forces can we achieve the kind of results that we want for ourselves and for our future generations. So it's an exciting time to be here in the State Department and working with all the men and women who are part of this, who come to work, energized every day by the excitement of being able to be part of making and shaping history. And I want to thank you all again for your service and hope that we can continue to draw on your experience and wisdom as we move forward. So thank you for being here. I'd be happy to take a few questions. I see we have mics here, and I know this is not a shy audience. So. Please. Secretary Steinberg, thank you. And please give our accommodation to Secretary Clinton. She's just done a marvelous job. We fully support her. <laughs> Would you please elaborate on what is called the Arab Spring? How are we reacting to the issues across 15 different countries, all of which we have a vital interest in? particularly Libya and Syria? Well, this is, as I've said, you know, really one of the most dramatic events. And you know, what's been interesting about watching this unfold is that I think, as many of you here know well, that on one level, kind of on the, the broadest strategic level, there's been a long-term awareness that there, the deep tensions that existed in many of these societies inevitably are going to lead to challenges to the existing order. Indeed, the secretary herself, even before the, uh, the revolution uh, uh, began in Egypt, gave a speech in Doha. Uh, and she described the, the political structures and the leadership uh, of the region as living on shifting sands. And so we had a deep sense that the tensions, both political and economic, through many of these societies, made them ripe for change. And yet, understanding both how, what the trigger would be and how they might unfold is a deep challenge. Uh, there is no. Uh, crystal ball that any of us have uh, that can look into the future and know for sure how these things are going to turn out. So we've tried to be gu guided by some basic principles, which is first, that the United States needs to be seen on the side of the same values and principles that we hold dear. That, that it's simply not sustainable for the United States to say that we can believe in democracy and freedom of expression and opportunity for us, 
but not for others. Our commitment to the universality of these values in the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration, going back to President Roosevelt, and, and has been such an important part of our own history, is something that we have to vindicate. At the same time, we recognize that these processes of change can be difficult. Even in more settled societies, like we saw in Central and Eastern Europe, the change requires developing a whole new generation of institutions and leaders who can take on and, and embody those basic universal aspirations into stable structures and governments. We've recognized that democracy is more than just holding an election. It's having open societies. It's having strong institutions and rule of law. It's having uh, accountability and dealing with problems of corruption and impunity. And so we've worked hard, in addition to being aspirationally associated with this, to try to engage both with governments and with the public to try to talk about how you build these institutions and how you make this impetus for change durable and lasting. We don't want to see these be a brief flowering of hope and then turned into something that doesn't meet the aspirations. Uh, we try to work where possible with governments that we have a long-term relationship, whether it was in Egypt or whether it's in the Gulf, uh, to try to encourage them to be supportive of this change and to recognize that they, rather than fighting it, they should work with it and to understand that their long-term interests are trying to, to be part of this process. But where, as we've seen in Libya, you have a government that not only refuses to embrace change, but actually goes out and murders its citizens. We have an obligation, I think, to take action. And what's been particularly uh, striking and encouraging about the situation in Libya was this was not just the United States, or not even just the United States and Europe, but it was coming from the Arab partners of Libya, who understood that in the 21st century, even in the Arab world, that uh, people and governments cannot sit by when a leader threatens to burn and annihilate his own people. And so it was the impetus from the Arab League calling for a no-fly zone. And the tremendous coalition that we've uh, uh, developed there that involves partners from uh, the, the Middle East as well as from the United States and Europe that are partnering in this effort to provide civilian protection and to try to find a political solution. We've also tried to work with our African friends to the African Union on this. And I think, as I say, it's a real model of this kind of 21st century, how do you build international cooperation to meet common challenges? We see this at the contact group meetings that just took place uh, just a day ago in Rome with all the countries from around the world trying to work together to bring a peaceful and stable solution. Please. Yes. Uh, first, I'd like to compliment you on, on the initiatives and innovations and, and vision that, that you and the others, Secretary Clinton and, and all the rest of the team have, have brought to our foreign policy. Uh, the one thing that, na the nagging issue that I think of as, I, as, you, as you were speaking is, how, what, what, what is the impact of the budget cuts? I understand, for example, that of the $38 billion re reduction uh, that's to take place between now and September 30th, $8 billion is to come out of the, the foreign affairs budget, which is state aid and, and a few other OPEC and Peace Corps. How is this going to impact all of these things you were talking about? And then also, as you look ahead to 2012 and beyond, when the advocates of, of, of uh, budget cuts uh, particularly target things like foreign aid, like our participation in international organizations as things that they really want to um, ruthlessly cut, how, how is this all going to work out in terms of these, these initiatives and programs and things that you're, you're, you're working on? <coughs> There's no doubt you put your finger on one of the great challenges that we face, and uh, we're all working hard to do more with little and more with less, uh, but resources are important. And we also recognize that uh, the fiscal health of our country is important, and that we, like everybody else, have to play a part in making sure that we have a sound fiscal future. But it has to be balanced, and it has to recognize that the, the cost and the, the, the demand uh, have to be balanced here, and that the foreign affairs budget, what we do is a very small part of the overall uh, federal budget, and uh, the benefit that's gained is enormous. So we have to be very rigorous in our own thinking to make sure that we've thought hard, to make sure that every dollar we request is one that we can justify and defend, that there's accountability for what we do, that there's uh, a measurable uh, a metric that allows us to demonstrate why we're making a difference with what we do. Uh, but we have to work hard to be an advocate for that. I mean, it's interesting that even though the budgets are under pressure, 
there's very little sort of motivation to say, well, let's just pull back and, uh, and not be engaged in the world. There's a broad support in this country and even in the Congress for this kind of engagement. And we just have to continue to make the case that we need the resources uh, to do what we want to do. A key part of that is really this um, core principle that the Secretary has advocated of smart power and a whole of government approach, to recognize that you can't have an unbalanced uh, engagement where one part of our international engagement, whether it's the, the military or national security part, isn't matched and complemented by the civilian piece. And that, that you, the synergy is critical here and to make sure that we do have a balanced approach. And we've been grateful for the support that Secretary Gates and uh, Chairman Mullen and others have given to our efforts because we recognize that it's presenting this in a holistic way. I think it's the best chance of sustaining the resources we need to do for our part of the mission. Yes. It's a think big question. With the events of last week, is it not time to declare a mission accomplished in Afghanistan and not wait another two or three years to put the troops on a slow boat uh, off the shore of Libya uh, until Gaddafi gets the word that it's time for him to leave? Well, I, I think on the one hand, uh, none of us um, underestimate the, the significance of the uh, end of uh, Osama bin Laden. At the same time, uh, there's still a very uh, potent and effective apparatus that we've been chipping away at called Al-Qaeda, which is still in Pakistan and still trying to have its way in Afghanistan. And the mission that the President has outlined there remains critical to us, uh, that we cannot allow a future of Afghanistan where uh, Al-Qaeda is able to return to the safe haven it had before 9-11 and be able to plot and, uh, and undertake its attacks. Without getting into details, although I'm sure you will hear them in the coming days and weeks, one of the things we're learning uh, as we uh, learn from what we've discovered during this remarkable uh, raid that was undertaken uh, last week is that there were active plotting, and some of that plotting continues to focus on our country. And so we remain in danger, and we have to be very alert to that. And the most effective way to deal with this is to strategically defeat al-Qaeda. So there's important work to be done, and it's important to make sure that they don't uh, escape from the pressure that they're on now uh, through reestablishing themselves in Afghanistan. So that remains a critical part of our strategy and it's, the President has outlined how we uh, intend to pursue it through a phased transition going forward. We're going to try to do this quickly to give two more opportunities for questions. Jim, thank you very much for those comments. I thought I was going to ask you a hard question, but after that one, I, this is probably not too tough. It has to do with Iran and the Iran sanctions. The administration, specifically this department and Treasury, is go it seems to be under increasing pressure uh, to sanction additional companies, this time from countries where, frankly, our foreign policy interests are a little bit more sensitive. I uh, refer to a recent Senate Banking Committee hearing just a few days ago. Uh, I guess my question is more, what is, what is the priority that the administration generally puts to uh, hard implementation of sanctions as compared to other foreign policy priorities that we have with those countries that appear to be very much in the mind of many members of Congress and outside groups looking at this. Um, I know that a lot of times the issue gets framed in terms of trading off sanctions versus other interests, but actually we think about it very differently. Our goal is to have a uh, dramatic impact on the elements of the Iranian economy and political system that support their nuclear missile program. And sanctions are a tool to help do that. But what we've discovered very dramatically is that in many cases, it's the threat of sanctions rather than the imposition of sanctions that makes the difference. And one of the things that we're very proud of is that we have seen a dramatic decline of economic engagement with Iran, a dramatic decline of investment in their energy sector, a dramatic uh, restriction of their access to the banking sectors without actually having to impose sanctions because we've been able to convince companies and countries to pull back. And so in many cases, while well, people say, well, why haven't you sanctioned? The reason we haven't sanctioned is because through diplomacy, we've been able to convince countries to stop doing what they were doing before and to not go forward with other investments. This has been especially true in the energy and banking sectors, but it's elsewhere. And so in our engagement with Congress, uh, we want to make clear that while we're not opposed to uh, imposing sanctions, even among important countries, that we want to maximize the leverage because that the point of greatest influence is before you actually impose it, but, but have the credibility to, to, to threaten it. And that has been the focus of our efforts. One more. Mr. Secretary, the future is not what it used to be. You, <laughs> Sounds like something that Yogi Berra must have said. <laughs> it's very true. Thank you for 
putting the way forward clearly to us and also to Pat Kennedy. The problem is that you are fighting a two-front war. You are fighting a war of diplomacy and development in the world based on very serious challenges, but you do not have the resource base that is secure to accomplish those goals. In particular, the Secretary of State, the Department of State, has taken on responsibility for the protection and transport of all U.S. assets in Iraq. That is a $2 billion request uh, pending before the Congress. If you do not get that money, what happens? Second question. Let me let me do the one because I right. unfortunately because I've got I've got it. but you know we we obviously believe that the mission in Iraq is an enormously important one and that the achievements that have been accomplished over the last several years have created the prospect of a more stable, more democratic, more open society uh, in Iraq. But the business is not done. It's very fragile as we've seen through the difficulties of the government formation process. And we believe that part of uh, our opportunity to have a success in Iraq and more broadly in the Middle East is to transition from a, a military-centric uh, engagement to a more traditional uh, civilian engagement through what we call the Strategic Framework Agreement with Iraq. Uh, it's important to have the resources to do that, and we will be making that case to the Congress. There's no doubt that with fewer resources, our ability to sustain that engagement, to support the political and economic reforms that are needed in Iraq will be challenged. So we're going to continue to be up there and make that case. Uh, we'll obviously have to adjust our efforts to the resources that we get, but uh, nobody should doubt that we're fighting because we do think it's important and we want to continue that effort. So once again, thank you for all your service and everything you've done. Once again, if I could ask you to please remain seated in this room. We'll pull the screen down and you'll have uh, a very good view of the AFSA plaque ceremony. Uh, AFSA President Susan Johnson is going to escort Deputy Secretary Steinberg at this time. Thank you again.